Welcome all. Thank you for joining today. We had a nice plenary and we are ready to discuss some of the topics in detail in this breakout group on social aspects. Um, I'll just have a quick presentation to introduce everyone how this breakout group will be even today. Please let me know if you could see the slides. Yes, it's good. It's good. Okay, so uh, this is a brief outline. Uh, what I'll do is I'll spend maybe five minutes to introduce our panelists and discussants. And then each of our panel members will have five minutes each to share their thoughts, views, a small presentation perhaps. And then we will go to our discussant and they will have five, 10 minutes to share their thoughts, comments, compliments, any contradictions on what panel members have shared. And then we will get into interactive in-depth discussion where all participant questions, comments, or any other thoughts will be entertained. Uh, we will um, take about 15 minutes of time for this activity. Then we'll come back to panelists for any further comments, thoughts, or any, uh, any views. And similarly, last 10 minutes for discussion to kind of provide uh, an overarching uh, take home message kind of thing. And then if time still remaining, then I'll try to wrap up and provide a brief summary. So that, that's the general outline of our one hour uh, breakout group. So we will have three panelists. Do you see the slide mode or you're still on the same slide? Yeah, slide mode. Okay, good. So, uh, okay, good. So we have three speakers. Uh, Yuti Ariani, Moira Moilana, and Sarah Novanli. And then we'll provide brief introduction. Yuti is a postdoctoral researcher at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. She completed her PhD from Endhoven University of Technology, where she combined development studies and innovation. Can I ask others to kindly mute their microphone? Thank you. So during her PhD, she combined development studies and innovative science to understand socio-technical change in biofuel case. And currently her research focuses on the role of community participation in peatland restoration in Indonesia. Second panelist is Moira Molana. She is a senior associate in C4 based in Bogor. She has worked on various themes related to forest governance, including conservation, community-based forest management, social forestry, decentralization, and more recently climate change under global comparative study on Red Plus, looking at national policy issues. Third speaker is from private sector, she is currently head of sustainability compliance for Asia Pulp and Paper Sinar Mass. She oversees various sustainability in initiatives across APP's Indonesia operations, including CSR program, social compliance, and stakeholder engagement to meet APP's sustainability roadmap vision 2020 2030. She has done joint master's degree in agricultural economics from Gadamaja University and University of Tokyo. And she has more than 15 years of experience across sustainability certification, supply chain, stakeholder management, and business process management. So those would be our three panelists today. And then we will move on to our discussant. It would be Josie. Josie Katrina works for Teparchaya Initiative. She is uh, also part of Inobu team. 
She is a senior researcher at Indonesian Center for Environment Law and has previously served as senior legal counsel in the Indonesian Red Plus Agency. She pursued her PhD at Melbourne Law School and working on environment law and governance. So UT, Yossi and uh, Moira were also part of our last webinar. So we had an opportunity to hear some of their research, some of their work earlier. Today, uh, we will be hearing more from them and we will uh, listen what they have to say and share their perspective. So before uh, going to listen to all of them and your own discussion, I would like to just request all uh, participants to keep their microphone muted. And then I hand over the floor to our first panelist, UT. Floor is yours, UT. Thank you, Rupesh. I will share my screen. Yeah, please do. Okay. Great. Does it move? Right. Yeah, it's working. Great. Yeah, it's working, but yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to be here and to meet you all. So, institutions and social cohesiveness uh, in safeguarding peatlands and also like the community. Um, right. So this is an illustration. So I'm I'm really um, I really like like Mark Reed uh, presentations because uh, he basically um, mentionings like uh, the needs to be the indicate once it's kind of like representing what happened in the ground. So uh, in these presentations, I want to give you the illustration first uh, about like what happened in the ground. So one of the things that's being uh, adopted uh, for the peatland restoration is the no burning policy. So um, I use this case study. It's happening in, in Spongen area uh, based on the research by Hartman uh, and college. Um, so in this uh, in these illustrations, you can see that there's a relationship between there's the no burning policies um, and how it's affecting the land clear, uh, clearing through burning, but it's also happen, uh, create like the a new way of uh, land clearing, which is through manual weeding. But what happened is because the manual weeding needs a lot of times, then like uh, many people, uh, many farmers choose to either stop uh, uh, cultivating maize. Uh, and then even like shifting to oil palm. So this is kind of like a trade off between like, you have this no burning policy, but then it's also kind of like threatening uh, the livelihood of the local people over there. So after there's this no burning policy, it's uh, reducing the maize uh, plantations from 200 hectares to 60 hectares. So um, in terms of safeguarding, the question is really like what type of alternative livelihood that can be introduced to the community and also uh, how to increase their, their profit because there's cases where uh, the men need to go outside the, the villages because they don't no longer able to work there. So in terms of like a criteria and indicators, the question is really like how to capture the phenomena and when you have like one policy, what type of like policy that can address not only like, hey, you're not allowed to burn anything anymore, but also like how to, um, have a policy that's also supporting the local community. I mean, you can have uh, like indicators or criteria where there's no more fires and then people already move uh, to a different type of livelihood, but you also need to ask questions like what's the impact of these policies and what happened if the, the man needs to go outside the, the village to work as a labor in the, in the cities or become like a drivers and other things. So this is the, this is kind of like the, the opening questions on what is the right indicators and what is the type of, of criteria that's needed. Uh, and that uh, leads uh, to this, the, the proposed like criteria and indicators. So as pa Pabudi mentions uh, before uh, BRG uh, done their projects, they already done like um, a, a appraisals and then it's being um, uh, translated into what they call the yearly planning. Uh, and that is really based on the biophysicals and also the peat hydrological unit uh, where they, they try to map several villages and, and um, address like the villages, oh, this, this area should get like the peat care villages and all. So this part's already been done. Uh, but what I uh, found it interesting is like in the appraisal, the preliminary appraisal, they have this um, mapping of the conflicts. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's not 
uh, beyond their authority to solve this uh, conflict. So the question is whether uh, there are some things already been done uh, to solve the, especially like the tenure um, conflicts or the land conflicts. And uh, after that, uh, it's the criterion indicators for the selection criteria. So uh, for rewetting, uh, it's really identifying how the villagers use the canals because in sometimes like based on the BRG, they already select the area, but there's like the local elites and then the local elites really wants the, the canals blocks being um, placed in particular area. So what type of negotiation happen on the field and also like the inclusiveness. So uh, from my uh, field experience, what, I hap uh, what happened is uh, one of the requirements to have the BRG project is uh, you have to involve the community and then to uh, bring this local community into the project is you have to create like the uh, the community group which calls like POCMAS uh, but sometimes and this is quite effective so it's, it's kind of like questionable whether you're supporting this or not uh, it's based on like the the village had like a relative so in in my case uh, like the brothers involved in the POCMAS and also like the wife also involved in the POCMAS but because it's very powerful and then like most of the villagers uh, join them and then like the project succeed. But then you can, can question whether it's good or not. And for the revegetation, you really need to, to find, especially to, to select the species, uh, uh, like one of the bidding accepted uh, concepts, the paludi cultures that uh, combine the ecology, social and economy, and also the revitalization. So the, what type of like social change that happened and whether the alternative livelihood really works. And that comes to the my last um, criteria, so the transition criteria, and this is, what I've considered as very important to see. So at the beginning stage, uh, the approach for the peatland restoration usually is protection. So there's like many uh, resources being mobilized into the village level. And then it's usually like the first uh, year is really succeed because there's many like resources going on and there's many monitoring also going on. But then like uh, after the second years, then it's become like the questionable whether there's like an institutional process uh, and like by, institutionalizations um, I'm referring to whether the, the village already adopted into their uh, own local uh, regulation or not whether there's also fundings coming from the village instead of like the regional level or national level and then the latest uh, step is really like the sustainability so continuous of funding support uh, either through the market system so whether they're able to create a new market for the alternative livelihood or not and or whether like the whole, uh, how the local actors adopt the restoration activities or another possibilities like continuous funding support. So BRG or like Mitraan or on any other um, uh, institutions will support the village continuously. Thank you. I will give back the floor to Rupesh. Thank you, Yuti. That was just about right on time, just a few seconds over so that we can, we can manage that. So thank you so much for touching on these topics. I will uh, say a few questions after we have all three panelists spoken and then we can kickstart discussion. So next panelist is Moira. Moira, are you ready to share your screen? Okay, I'll try. Yep. Good, it's working. You just need okay. to move to screen slide one, yes. Yeah, the only thing that's not working is putting it on slideshow. Anyway, okay. good afternoon. Thank you for all for being here. Uh, I would like to start uh, with some uh, conclusions from my precious, previous uh, PowerPoint at this webinar on social connections. And uh, uh, I want to highlight that even though uh, we are talking about remote villages. The, the most remote rural households and communities are embedded in multiple social networks that link people, institutions, and places. And also that rural communities are related. Pardon? Can, can you hear me? Okay. So also rural communities, rural communities and related governance systems are highly diverse. So it consists on a combination of formal and informal elements. And there are uh, uh, problems of power relations. Also, uh, peatland restoration 
must be relevant if people want to participate in it. And furthermore, there is always conflict and cooperation in these uh, villages. Also, rural communities are not static. They, there is always some change. So uh, with peatland restoration, the experience in cooperating in peatland restorations, new development, new opportunities, new knowledges will also lead to new networks. And it will also lead to change context in which people will behave differently. And perhaps in the process, they will change their aspirations. So maybe uh, while in the beginning participation is enough, by the end, they want to have more out of participation. So with this background, uh, one important aspect is that peatland restoration needs to include aspects of education and information dissemination. And in this, only depending on or focusing on formal institutions might result in marginalization, marginalization within communities. While if you only depend or focus on informal institution, you might risk uh, the, losing the support of the village leader, the elite, or even the higher up uh, uh, levels of government. So to convey effective effectively information and promote equal access to participation, we need both the formal and the informal channels. With regard to monitoring, and it has been mentioned in the earlier presentation as well, the use of a more or less standard criterion indicator framework within a social network analysis allows us to measure progress, but also the changes that will occur. It allows us to identify errors in the, in the process. So thereby it allows us to adjust programs if necessarily. And of course, specifically to social network analysis is that we, uh, and the need to empower local people is that the network will feel which uh, group of actors need the empowering and which one are already empowered. So a very simple uh, look at how networks are created. We, uh, we do a simple survey asking different contacts, member ABC, uh, with whom they exchange information, with whom they are in contact, with whom they sit in a labor exchange network, for example, and then uh, using uh, sometimes you can program it in, an, in, a, in a computer program or you use, uh, use other programs, you can uh, map out their relations in a nice diagram. So uh, the core of this presentation basically is that from the perspective on social connections and monitoring applying a social network analysis, we have to figure out different networks that are important for uh, peatland res res uh, restoration. For example, information exchange networks might be very important, but also labor networks with whom do they traditionally work together. And so uh, the basic criteria that we want to know is connectivity. Connectivity. While the indicators, we, we want to look at density, uh, which is basically how closely a network is released related. So uh, when a density is close to one, for example, the network is said to be dense. And so there are a lot of connections. The whole community is very well uh, connected. Then there is the degree centrality, which is also an, a, an indicator of uh, who is important in the community from certain aspects, from information exchange or from leading the, the labor. So these are basically the number of ties a node has to other nodes. So it's basically uh, who is connected to you. And if a if lot of people are connected to you, then it means that you are central and have a privileged position in the networks. But for exchanging information, between us might be a more uh, important indicator because this is uh, showing uh, 
showing the, co the, the connectedness from the perspective of you are in between, you are the person that passes on in, in uh, information. So uh, the more central, the more times information passes to you. Then there is another one which is called closeness. And this is uh, how close you are to other, other nodes. So the greater the distance to other nodes, the less chance you have of receiving information and resources in a timely way. And I just want to insert a note of caution here because we did a survey, for example, in a longhouse. A longhouse, people live very close together because it's basically an apartment where an apartment building where every household has a, has a separate apartment, but they have a common, common room. You would think that information is disseminated very easily through this common area because everybody always passes there and they rest in the common area and they meet each other there. But then in, in looking closely, we saw that some uh, households are actually not plugged into uh, the network of the house of, of the longhouse and they are a bit marginalized and do not even know the simples of information that is talked about in this common room, just because for one reason or another, they don't mix as well. So even though it looks like a very homogeneous rural community, it might not be. And so for peatland restoration, if you really want participation and really want to uh, promote empowerment and equity, these are things to, uh, to take note of. So- uh, What yeah. time is actually, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, social network analysis might not be standard practice in many monitoring activities. So it might be useful to consider as part of the monitoring in tropical restoration. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. That was great. We will come back to this. This is very interesting. And as you said, it's probably not uh, <coughs> considered that much. So it's an important aspect. We will have more discussion on this topic, uh, but let's move on to our third panelist will be Sarah. Sarah, you ready to share your screen? Yes, I will share my screen. Yeah. Thank you. Is it work? Yes, good. Uh, it's still not on presentation mode, but yeah, now it's on presentation mode. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for giving us opportunity uh, to present our role of private sectors in supporting community initiative uh, in peatland protection and restoration. As we know all that communities play key role uh, in effort to protection and restoration, it is important to engage and empower commun communities positively. Our main objective uh, to empower communities is to improve their welfare so that they no longer rely on expansion of the land or opening forests for livelihood. And now APP uh, launched uh, Desa Makmur Peduli Api or the MPA program in 2015 uh, with target of 500 villages uh, in five provinces uh, where APP suppliers are operating uh, with total budget 10 million US dollars. Currently uh, up to June 2020, uh, the MPA program already covers 390 villages and more than 30,000 uh, households involved. And it is also more than 80 uh, women group that involved in the programs. Uh, in improving our program, uh, we have the multi-stakeholder collaboration with C4, ICRAF, and YETCAN. And this main objective of the collaboration is to develop the business model that balance community livelihood and also with the protection aspect. In this collaboration, uh, the third parties, uh, C4, ICRAF, and YECAN also come up with the key performance indicators. And another uh, collaboration, we have collaboration uh, with uh, Gechinde and IDH. 
based it is uh, focus on community based forest restoration in Musi Banyu Asin. Uh, the program is uh, cover the activities such as uh, establishment of uh, nurseries and also local cooperatives and giving training to the local communities. And how to measure the performance of the MPF program that involve uh, communities in the pitland area. It is not an easy task for us, but we are trying to evaluate the performance uh, through combining the qualitative and quantitative analysis that transforming to the scoring system uh, by approaching and using the criteria and indicators uh, resulted from our collaboration with C4, ICRAP, and YECA. As I mentioned before that uh, currently there are 390 villages that already involved in the program, but uh, within those 390 villages, uh, there are 90 villages are located in pit area. Uh, let's focus on this uh, matrix. Uh, we are uh, showing our uh, methodology or our uh, system to evaluate the program. Uh, there are three main criteria, criteria. The first is environmental protection. There are some indicators in this criteria, uh, such as warning raising, uh, then reducing use of fire in land preparation, and also there are reducing fire incident and securing protection area. Uh, the main objective in our uh, the MPR program also to reduce the risk of fire in a forest area. So you can see also here our scoring uh, between four and five for the some indicators. And the second criteria is about the sustainable livelihood. Uh, there are some indicators like diversity livelihood alternative, increasing income, and also the good agriculture practices and also the market access. Uh, here uh, you can see our scoring is in the middle or in the medium because as our understanding and the or uh, experience in the field, it is very uh, challenging to implementing the program also in the pit area because there are need uh, more support, more effort because need uh, more infrastructure facilities and also how to really train the community to shifting the mindset and also to engage with them. And also this about the strategic partner, partnership criteria. We have some indicator about the increase, the number of community involved in the partnership and then also community involvement in fire prevention and also the strengthening community organization and also how we develop the good relation with the community and other stakeholders. And the last is we would like to share also our lesson learned and also uh, challenges uh, in implementing this program. First is the sustainability impact of the program uh, could not be measured in early stage, even though the program already implemented within five years. And the second lesson learned and challenges is about the shifting community mindset to non-timber forest product and also uh, relying on the land expansion. What we are uh, doing here to emphasize to the community what their need is to focus on increasing land productivity with giving them uh, alternative livelihood not focus on the land expansion. And the third is about the pit land management. It is about uh, the high cost program and particularly for the equipment and infrastructure for water management. So it will impact to the cost and also the access to the market. And the last is about the acceleration of the program really depend on the community capacity, including managing, uh, managing the organization and also the farmer groups. I think all of this also already uh, brought by two speakers before. So I think it can be mixed and also can be strengthened uh, for the next uh, exploring the criteria and indicators. Thank you. I give the floor to Rupes. Thank you, Sarah. That was good to hear the perspective and the work and activity that uh, uh, you are involved with and uh, your company, APP, is uh, heavily engaged within the landscape. 
So thanks for sharing that. We will definitely come back and ask some questions, but uh, I'll invite Yossi now to, to bring her perspectives and maybe uh, add, add her inputs, insights, comments, questions, or commentary, anything that she wants to say on our three speakers and in general on peatland criteria indicators. So Yossi, floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Rupas. And thank you to all of our panelists. I really enjoy uh, your presentation. And I personally think that um, uh, even for Terpercaya, it is, it is a very important uh, insights. And uh, I will bring this uh, back to our work in Terpercaya. Uh, so before I start my comment, would it be OK for me to share just one slide, uh, Rupas, uh, just to, yeah. to, Please. to forward? OK. Um, All right, I hope this is the correct one. Okay, so the reason for me to start uh, my comment with this uh, presentation as a, a stepping stone uh, toward my comment is because I would like to bring forward how the Prachaya use uh, the purpose of indicators under the social pillars to select uh, from uh, many other indica indicators that were uh, suggested during the uh, indicators development process. So there are two important uh, uh, consideration at that uh, time. The first one is that acknowledgement uh, that smallholders are important in the development of sustainability and they have problems to access the market. So we have that under um, indicator 11 and 12, smallholders share and smallholders registration. And the other purpose is that We'd like to recognize that plantations bring impact to the marginalized groups. Uh, and therefore, uh, there are three indicators that, uh, that were introduced to uh, recognize this. Uh, the existence of free and prior informed consent, the recognition of customary rights and conflict resolution. But for your information, the FPIC and the conflict resolution, the indicator eight and 10 in Terpercaya, we don't actually have the data uh, for that uh, at this stage. So I just, um, have I finished my sharing or no? Actually, no. okay. So I just would like to, uh, to bring uh, that forward um, as a stepping stone, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I would like to, to you know, to, to, to take us together uh, to think about the purpose of the suggested indicators in um, peatland restoration, uh, because as uh, as I understand from the presentation uh, that are uh, uh, shared with us, I might be wrong, but at least there are four there are four uh, purposes that can be uh, that might be uh, under the uh, back mind of the. Uh, presenters uh, to suggest these indicators. The first one, uh, probably to address issues in which community have been perceived as one of the drivers that contribute to pitland degradation. I see this indication from uh, Ibu Sarah presentation, for example, uh, because uh, she suggested that to reduce number of fires used by community in land preparation, uh, agriculture practices and market access are important indicators uh, in the context of pitland restoration. Uh, and therefore, uh, without such policy or access, uh, local community could be detrimental to peatland quality and restoration. So uh, if I understand it correctly, good indicators would be able to address this issue. Another purpose that might be uh, suggested would be that um, community are important actors to improve efficacy of the restoration program itself. And this is strongly indicated in Ibu Yuti's presentation and also in Ibu Moira's presentation. Or probably, uh, Esther Percaya, uh, it is an acknowledgement that actually pitland restoration program uh, bring impact, a negative one to the local community livelihood. Uh, it is also I sense from Ibu Yuti's presentation. And also Ibu uh, Sarah uh, suggests that uh, there are role of other actors such as private sectors uh, in, 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 you know, either strengthening or as a policy to uh, to reduce the impact uh, or the role of uh, local community uh, 
in you know in degradation of peatland. Uh, but whatever purposes that are suggested by these indicators, it is important. Uh, I think we all agreed to stick to the uh, to, to the one mentioned by Pak Budi in the beginning of the presentation that BRG needed the indicator to measure progress, measure project impacts, outputs, and inputs, and identify areas to require uh, to increase attention by relevant stakeholders. So maybe it is helpful to to place these suggested indicators uh, to those uh, suggested need of the BRG. Uh, why it is important, I would I would uh, share it at the end of this person uh, at, at the end of my comment. The second issue that uh, uh, that is also important, also mentioned by Professor Reed, is the workable proxy uh, for each of the suggested indicators. Because as uh, social scientists, uh, I believe that all of uh, Ibu Yuti and uh, Ibu Moira in particular understand that there are many uh, ways that we can. Um, measure a particular indicator. So the challenge is really to think what proxy. And at the practical level, based on my uh, work in Terpercaya, it is important to, uh, to think about data availability. And uh, I really think that the suggested factors and indicators uh, suggested by Ibu Yuti and Ibu Moira and also Ibu Sarah are, are really, really important, but Maybe my limitation as non-social scientist, it makes me very cautious because I'm not familiar with the data that are available to actually measure these indicators. Uh, because um, in Terpercaya, we work with uh, government programs, and um, it seems like what are suggested by Ibu Yuti, for example, it won't be easily uh, uh, find in the uh, government um, uh, documents. So. Probably, but I might be very wrong about this Ibu Yuti, but probably, uh, or Ibu Moira as well, uh, it, you need to do field work, surface, or those kind of things to actually uh, get the data to, to, to measure the indicators. And the last consideration that I think um, is also important is the simplicity of the indicators. Because in terms of indicators, people in general, people like me, for example, and policymakers would like to see simple indicators, while some scientists such as Ibu Yute and Ibu Moira, you are fully, fully understand that even the identified factors that you already shared with us might be not enough to explain a particular social phenomenon. But uh, surely we'll have to find the middle ground uh, between you know, the ideal and the simplicity needed by uh, people in general. So for example, if I may ask Ibu Yuti, among the many factors that you have identified in your presentation that contribute to the local uh, institution and social cohesiveness, what is or are the most important or key indicators in your opinion? So if you need to select, uh, what, what it, would it be? And the two previous consideration that I mentioned, uh, that is the relevance and the availability of data might be helpful. To, to uh, for um, uh, everyone to actually sort uh, the and select the indicators. Uh, maybe that's uh, Rupas for now. Thanks so much for the uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Yossi. This is very good uh, as a startup. And then uh, we'll continue this discussion uh, back and forth. Uh, so I will invite UT to respond to your direct question. But then I think now, uh, again, for audience and for other participant members, the floor is kind of open to, to share your thoughts and ask questions or share some comments. And then we will have a, maybe at least spend next 10 minutes uh, deliberating this topic. So Yuti, over to you. Mm -hmm. Actually, like the BRG already addressed this issue uh, about the land tenure issue, um, because that is like one of the biggest um, problem. And uh, in this previous meeting, we also have like the questionnaire and then like most of the people said that like land tenure issues is, like one of the biggest uh, issues in, in the village. And especially because in, in my site, like land conflicts and also like concession has become like the problem. Uh, and then there's like a transition. But actually the RG already ha uh, has this data. Uh, and they also have the, like the data about the paralegal because uh, what, what the BRG did is they, they, they create like a map, the conflict mapping, and then they put like paralegal for each villages. And then like they have a report on 
um, what the paralegal do at the village level. So the data is uh, is under like the DPG, so under Bumirna uh, deputy, and already uh, ha uh, have this uh, this uh, data. So I mean, like I totally agree. I mean, uh, the reason why I moved from quantitative to qualitative is also because of I don't really trust the data, uh, and <laughs> that's the reason. Like, okay, just like focus small, but I. I, I I really understand as a policymaker, you really need to to have like a, a like database a policy, and then the quantities become very important. But because this is uh, one of the biggest problem uh, at the village level, so BRG really put like uh, interest in in this matter, and they also have like the systems on how to solve this uh, conflict issues, and also like the paralegal is addressing the land issues and also like the fire issues because sometimes uh, when there's like a fires and the villagers are being um, brought to the court and the paralegal help the, the villagers to solve this. So there are data uh, uh, in, in, in Bumirna's uh, deputy about the, the like the success level and also like the number of the report and everything. So, thank you, Yuti. What, uh, you see, you are muted if you are you are saying something. But I would like to touch upon this and see this lack of data is uh, not new or not, uh, I would say, a unique feature for social aspects. A lack of data is when you talk about peatland restoration, it's always a sliding scale. Like, you know, there are, even for biophysical, for governance, uh, the data which may be really, really useful may be lacking or maybe not easily accessible. And then the level, the, the, the accuracy, the, the quantity, the resolution, all those are issues with data. Even in, in very like countries where they have done a very good job in taking care of their natural resources or managing them, maintaining them. So that is a persistent problem. Uh, but in terms of finding a solution, how do you arrive at a compromise uh, my question is, can private sector, and since here we have... You think like Bu Moira can answer and then like uh, Busera can answer? And then if uh, Rupesh return, then we can give the floor back to Rupesh. Okay. <laughs> and I think there's a question asking whether I axiomize the social connection in related to collective action. Actually, personally, I have not done specific research using as an on collective action, but I think it, it can be done. Basically, uh, uh, use understanding how people connect to each other will also make you understand uh, how collective action can, can be promoted or not. And uh, regarding the data, I think uh, BRG itself has lots of data already, so we do not need only to rely on uh, government formal. Like I said, we need the formal and informal, and that also relates to data. We not only we cannot only rely on government data, but we also have to use the informal data. Okay. Thank you, Moira. Sorry, I was disconnected for a moment. So I've just joined with my phone now, um, network with some issues. Uh, so I missed a little bit of your uh, uh, thoughts there, but uh, I think the rest everyone was here. Um, yeah, so one other question, and I think there is some comment also in the chat group. Uh, I was looking at it when, when I got disconnected and I have lost that chat now because uh, I've done, but uh, if anyone uh, like to comment on that question, I'm really sorry. I cannot have the question here in this new window because the Zoom connection was gone. Uh, but if anyone wants to take on and respond to that, oh, here it is. Okay, I think Bumoira already answered it. Good. Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, how do you, uh, Ibu Sarah, you want to respond? You want to say something? Yeah, I think there's a question from Pa Ali for us uh, from APP Sinarmas. Yeah. Uh, you give us opportunity to answer from. Uh, yes, 
Okay. Please, please. Uh, thank you, Pak Rupes. Uh, thank you, Pak Ali, for your uh, reminder to us about uh, the MPL program in West Kalimantan. Actually, our program is continuing to the community, uh, but some program is uh, using the system like rolling over from the select uh, selective uh, group of farmers and become to move to other group of farmers. But from the previous program, it will be continue monitored by our team in the field. But uh, let me take this as our uh, improvement stage later on, and we will check in the field. But as a basis, we will continue to uh, monitor and assist our uh, farmers or group of farmers in the village level uh, under our DMPL programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Sarah. So I realize we have about 10 minutes left. Um, are there any questions from the participants? Any other thoughts, any other views? I, while we are waiting, do you have any response, Yossi, from what uh, um UT said what I said what Ibu Moira said. Any any thoughts, any comments? Yeah, okay. Just just one thing that came to mind when Ibu Moira mentioned about the use of informal data. Um, I just wonder Berge might be a very different um with uh, other uh, um, government institution, but it seems like uh, at least for other institution, particularly when there is a consequence of um, indicators, uh, for example, if it's going to use fiscal incentive, incentive um, we need to keep in mind that of informal data should have a very um, legitimate reasons and very clear methodology, would I, which I believe that um, scientists like Ibu Moira would be uh, pay a very close attention to. But it is just uh, something that needs uh, that at least in the terpercaya context, for example, we decided not to use, but we leave it there as a comparison. But at this stage, that we decided to only use uh, all of the formal data. But it it, it is um, it, it is actually uh, very interesting to to know more about this Bumoira. If you can share with us the the examples or something that you already plan to to use uh, for this particular indicator and whether it is going to be something this informal data uh, is going to be produced regularly or not. Uh, maybe those two questions, Rupas, thank you. Ibu Moira, you have any yes, response? Yes. Uh, I, was, I, was th I was thinking of course, when it has a financial consequence, there need to be a sort of more objective indicator. But I think even so, uh, this indicator need to be uh, uh, agreed on by uh, local people because often the way formal data is collected is, is might not be the way local people perceive uh, what is actually happening. And uh, I'm, I, I haven't really uh, done any monitoring for a long time, so I'm a little bit out of date. And at that time, uh, the project was really very simple. But uh, I think there need to be caution as well. Uh, or maybe I should say, The monitoring and the criterion indicator should have actually been there from the very beginning. So if there is a financial consequence in terms of uh, incentives, people really know what is expected of them and can act accordingly. While if it's all, all very unclear from the beginning, there might, might be other reasons for their participation, which might then in fact uh, be negatively affected when suddenly there is money. So all this, what I'm saying is uh, the FPIC should really be done from the very beginning, not as an afterthought at the end, like uh, often happens. And uh, we also need to be cautious that 
formal data which is uh, produced and published officially might not always re reflect what really happened among the communities. So of course we do need some, some basic data and we do, do need to have an objective measurement in order to, uh, to, for example, to share incentives, but this should be with the knowledge of the people uh, involved. That is all I'm saying. And of course, there is, uh, there is this need for simplicity, but uh, things are very complex. So maybe the people that want simple should realize that it's more complex and the people that know it's complex should uh, learn how to, to translate things in a simple way. Thank you. That's, that's a very, very, very good point, I think. Uh, and one of the learnings from this uh, deliberations on social aspects is that it's very complex like it's entangled nature of different things where livelihoods uh, of people is involved, where their culture is involved, where their you know, migration and in-migration and out-migration is involved, their own aspirations uh, is involved, and that also is very dynamic. So I think that makes it really difficult, and I, I believe that that is the reason why biophysical uh, aspect has progressed more in terms of emphasis and and in terms of research and data because it's relatively speaking a little bit more straightforward uh, but nonetheless in terms of thinking about peatland restoration and success i think social aspect is very very important and it's a, a paramount that it needs to be considered, it needs to be taken into account right from the beginning, if long-term sustainable uh, success in peatland restoration is to be achieved. So what we were initially thinking we, when we were uh, talking about running this session about coming up with criteria and indicators which cover all, all these four aspects, when you're talking about social criteria indicators, one of the principle that uh, we were thinking about is, uh, and the principle is sort of the very high level, is that community well-being and equity is widely demonstrated. So whoever is conducting this restoration, whether it's under BRK or there are small um, entities at village level, whoever is conducting this activity, from the social standpoint, the principle should be that the community well-being and equity would, would be enhanced. So can we as a group uh, kind of agree on that thought that at a very high level, that should be the end goal or that should be the principle? Any thoughts on that? And we have just kind of five minutes or less than that. So I want to be run through a few things help me to provide a recap uh, in plenary. So any any thoughts on, on the principle? Does it sufficiently capture the idea? You can, turn, uh, uh, you can unmute and say whatever you think. Don't wait for me to invite you. Just say yes. Or this I have, I mean, I always have the tendency to make everything complex, as Bumoira said. So I, I cannot make things complex into like a like one sentences. Yeah, you you saying something? I, I think I missed on that. If it, if it were simple, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true, that's <laughs> true. So, and when we, we, we bring down to, to uh, come down to say criteria level, then also again, to define a term or come up with an idea that can uh, be used to have uh, different indicators which have all attributes. It's also a challenge in terms of what would you, would you come up with? So as a group, I know you have uh, shared a lot of information. You have talked about a lot of things in terms of uh, uh, 
whether it's uh, information exchange or social network analysis, whether it's the sustainability, whether it's the um, empowerment, gender equality. But what we, we have to like come up with few terminologies. How do we, we think about them? Could social capital captures that? that the, and then we will have indicators to measure that uh, aspect. And what I mean by social capital is whether gender equality is improved, whether their empowerment happens, 